Okay, welcome to my third video on stating, describing, and explaining in mechanics. So the diagram shows us a jet engine, and we can see the engine is moving to the left, and we can see air will be going in at A, so the air is traveling to the right, and it's heated up inside the engine, and it leaves at B at much higher speed. So state what happens to the momentum of the air as it passes through the engine. So stating questions are straightforward. We just want to know what the answer is. And we can clearly see it's going to increase. And the reason we know that is if the speed increases and the mass of the air stays constant, its momentum must increase. But all you needed here was it increases. OK, so explain using the appropriate laws of motion why the air exerts a force on the engine in the forward direction. Uh, so the two laws we're going to need are Newton's second and third laws. So we say the air has speed u at A, and at B it has speed v, which is bigger than u. So we can see from this that the air has experienced a change in velocity to the right. And that's going to be the key to using Newton's second law. So if it's experienced a change in momentum or a change in velocity towards the right, Using Newton's second law, which tells us the resultant force is equal to the rate of change of momentum, that tells us the air has experienced a force to the right. So then we can use Newton's third law. So if the air has experienced force to the right, the plane must experience a force to the left, which in this diagram is the forward direction. OK, so... In one second, a mass of 210 kilograms of air enters at A. The speed of this mass of air increases by 570 meters per second as it passes through the engine. Calculate the force that the air exerts on the engine. Uh, so I'm going to do this again using Newton's second law. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up. So we know the change in velocity is 570. And we know the mass per second that enters the engine, 210 kilograms. And we put those two parts together. We can see that it will give us a unit of kilogram meters per second squared, which is a Newton. So that's actually fairly straightforward. So now we're dealing with the landing. So when you land, they put up deflector plate to exert a decelerating force. Um, and what it tells us is they caused the air to leave the engine to be deflected by an angle, as we can see on the diagram. So the speed of the air leaving B is the same speed as the deflected air. Explain why the momentum of the air changes. So the key is the collision with the deflector plate. So uh, the air is going to experience a normal contact force to the left from the deflector plate because it, you can see that the air experiences a change in momentum to the left. So that's how we know, or that's how we can explain why the momentum change. So Newton's second law tells us if there's been a momentum change, there must have been a force in the direction of that change, and it's a normal contact force in this case. So the total horizontal decelerating force exerted on the deflector plates of the jet engine is 190 kilonewtons. Calculate the deceleration of the aircraft when it has a mass of seven times 10 to the four kilograms. So um, we are going to assume the aircraft has constant mass. So it's at this stage, it's not burning any fuel because it's landing. So that's a reasonable assumption to make. And if we can make that assumption, then we can use Newton's second law in the form F equals MA, rearrange to make A the subject, that gives us a value of minus 2.7. So the deceleration is just 2.7 meters per second squared. The aircraft lands on the runway, traveling at a speed of 68 meters per second with the deflector plates acting. So that tells us we know what the deceleration is. Calculate the distance the aircraft travels along the runway until it comes to rest. You may assume the decelerating force remains constant. And if we can assume that, that means we're allowed to use SUBAT equations to model this because constant force gives us constant acceleration. So we know the initial speed. We know the final speed, zero, because we're stopping it. We know the acceleration. Therefore, we can use SUBAT equations to allow us to solve how far it would travel, 850 odd meters. Suggest in practice why the decelerating force may not remain constant 
So there were two parts we used to calculate uh, the force, the rate at which air is going through the engine and the change in velocity when it hits the deflector plate. So I think both of these will decrease as the aircraft speed decreases, and that's what would cause the force to actually decrease. So moving into a different topic area, we're going to do some uh, moments in centre of mass. State what is meant by the centre of mass of an object. So I think there's two ways we can explain what that means. Um, so we will often model the centre of mass as the point where we can concentrate all the mass of the object and model the object as a particle with zero volume. Uh, so that we do that by concentrating the mass to the centre of mass. The other way we can know where the centre of mass is, it's the point on an object where if we apply a force, it would have a moment of zero. Um, so either of those two would be fine, uh, but typically the first one is the one we usually go for. So we've got a plank of wood of uh, mass 32 kilograms, length 4 metres, and it's used to help cross a ditch. Uh, we've got a rock in the middle of the ditch, which is used to support the plank, and we've got some dimensions shown. Calculate the supporting force from the rock when the plank is placed in the position as shown. Uh, so at the moment, we don't know the support force from the bank, so that's where I'm going to make the pivot. The whole system is stationary, so we can make whichever point the pivot we like. So taking moments about the bank, we know the weight force of the object is going to act from the middle, so that's 2 metres from the bank, and we know the support force is going to be 3.2 metres from the bank. We can re then rearrange it to calculate what the force is, so fairly straightforward. So the boy has mass 46 kilograms. Determine whether the boy can walk to the far end of the bank, so the opposite side, without it tipping. Support your answer with a calculation. Okay, so the first thing is, if the plank is going to tip, it will be when the boy has walked over the rock, and when the plank tips, it will make the normal contact force from the bank zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take moments about the rock, so we don't have to worry about the support force from the bank anymore. So we can just think about the moment from the plank and the moment from the boy. So if it's going to tip, it will do so when the boy is furthest from the pivot. So that is going to be 0 0.8 metres. Uh, the centre of mass of the plank is 1.2 metres from the rock. So we can calculate the moments of each. And we see that the moment of the plank is greater than the moment of the boy. So the plank isn't going to tip, it's going to actually stay in contact with the bank on the opposite side. Okay, so we've got a fully loaded lorry transporting water, and it starts from rest and travels along a straight road. I figure we've got a graph of the speed versus time, and the driving force on the lorry remains constant. Uh, so we've got some extra information. The total resistive force acting on the lorry increases with both speed and mass of the lorry and a large proportion of the mass of the lorry is due to the water which it is carrying. We've got another lorry also loaded with water with the same initial mass however at the instant it begins to move a large leak develops and water is leaking out. Okay, so that's the scenario. So what we need to do is discuss how the speed time graph will be different from that one shown in the figure and there are three key parts to address the shape of it, the initial gradient and the final speed. So I've put the key piece of information we've been given back on this slide because we're going to use this, especially for the second and third parts. So let's first address the shape of the graph. So initially, the air resistance is going to be zero or the resistive force is going to be very small. Um, so that's going to give us a large resultant force forwards from the driving force, so the object is going to accelerate. So that's why the speed starts to increase to start with. So as the speed increases, air resistance is also going to increase, and as will the, any other resistive force that it's talking about, because it says that increases with speed. So that's going to mean the resultant force decreases, which is going to cause the acceleration, which is the gradient of this graph, to decrease as well, which is what we can see on the graph. And eventually what's going to happen is the air resistance and the other resistive forces will become equal to the driving force, so the resultant force is zero 
and the acceleration is zero and the velocity becomes constant. So that's just explaining the shape of the figure. Now let's talk about the initial gradient. So um, I don't think there's going to be any change to the initial gradient. So at the start, not very much water is going to have leaked. So the resistive force is going to be pretty much the same and the mass is going to be pretty much the same. So we've got the same resultant force, the same res mass, so therefore we're going to have the same initial acceleration, which is why I think the gradient will be the same. OK, so then final part, the impact on the final speed. So by the end, a large amount of water will have leaked. Um, so as it approaches maximum speed, the mass of the lorry will have decreased. And it tells us that the resistive force increases with mass or it would decrease as mass decreases. So what that means is the lorry will be able to reach a higher speed before the resistive force is equal to the driving force and the acceleration is zero. So the final speed is going to be bigger. OK, so this finishes this week's video on state, describe and explain. Um, if you've got any, if you're confused about any of the points that were made in this video, please do ask me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So just comment on this video. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for taking the time to watch.